Welcome to the AEW Match Guide Podcast, where we deep dive into the best matches in AEW history. Brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network and your host, Sam Brown. Hello and welcome to the AEW Match Guide Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Brown. Thank you for joining me. Every episode, alongside a special guest, I take an in-depth look at one of the best matches in AEW's history. If you enjoy the show today, you can subscribe or rate it on your podcast app of choice, support the podcast financially through Red Circle, and make sure you check out all of the other great shows on the Social Suplex Podcast Network, where we cover all aspects of the world of pro wrestling. We've got One Nation Radio, Keeping It Strong Style, All Things Elite, Tunnel Talk, the Trish and Sarah Wrestling Podcast, Wrestle Art with Chris Things, and Imp's WWE Adventure. You can become part of the Social Suplex community by joining our Discord and check out the awesome match guide and Social Suplex merch on Chopped Tees. And of course, don't forget to check out the Match Guide Substack, where I drop my written pieces every other fortnight. Links for all of these things are in the podcast description. My guest for today is one of my favorite members of the internet wrestling community. She's a freelance writer and part of the Maps and Graps podcast. It's Lyric Swinton. And we're discussing Swerve Strickland versus Hangman Adam Page, Texas Deathmatch from Full Gear 2023. How are you going today, Lyric? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. It's uh, it's great to have you here. And I've got to thank you up front. You were one of the amazing writers that contributed to the Match Guide fifth anniversary list that we did earlier this year, where we chronicled the 50, we vote had votes in and, and chronicled the 50 greatest AEW matches uh, in their first five years. So I very much appreciate that. And I'm really looking forward to digging into this match with you today. I'm super excited. This is one of my all-time favorites, so I'm always happy to yap, yap, yap about this one. <laughs> yeah, well, look, it's it's Hangman Adam Page, who's one of my all-time favorite wrestlers at this point as well, and Swerve Strickland, who is is well and truly on the way to that sort of status as well. So uh, it's this is one that when I was uh, not podcasting and not doing this podcast, uh, I certainly, when I saw it, I penciled it in and was like, I'd like to do a podcast about this match so yeah i've been i've been burning with thoughts and takes and all that so let's get into it um as we always do on the match guide podcast so lyric uh for for new guests i'll always uh, ask how was it that you got into aew wow um that's an interesting story so i've been in wrestling since 2006 so i was like eight years old And when I went to college, like that was my goal, like to like I wanted to work in wrestling. I wanted to do wrestling and I actually majored in sport and entertainment management. And I remember I was so discouraged, like about the wrestling scene at that point. Like I was it just it didn't really feel like it was fitting. I felt like I had outgrown it and I kind of like grew out of it a, a lot while I was in school. I was so busy doing different things, like I was involved in everything on campus. And then All In happened. And it was like one of those rare moments. Like I actually forced myself to like clear my schedule, sit down. And I just remember I was like, oh my gosh, like this is incredible. And I actually got came to All In like as far as like watching it because of Cody. I was a huge Cody fan um, while I was in, while I was growing up. And I always felt like he had more potential. And so like that was how I got into it. And then when the original press conference happened, like I remember watching it and I was like, huh, this sounds really cool. I've never like seen the birth of a promotion before. And like, uh, obviously I started watching, I watched the, bought the first double or nothing. And it got kind of hard to like stay involved, just like, I guess into wrestling as a whole. Cause I just had a lot going on in my life at that point. I was like never home before midnight cause I was so busy like on campus and everything. Um, but I caught like, you know, some AEW during the pandemic. I always liked it. I would try to watch pay-per-views um, whenever I could. But in 2022, there was the, they ran in South Carolina for the first time. And I went to a show and I was like, I've been to wrestling shows before, but the energy has never been like this. What and was so the show? Every, what was on the show? It was, um... It was Dynamite. Who, well, I forgot what the main event was, but I know for a fact it was the night that Tony Storm debuted in um, AEW. And I had always thought that she was 
such a star. She had so much potential. And I felt like, you know, like we hadn't seen the best of her. And so like, I remember that night was so special to me because she debuted and like, that was the lead into Forbidden. We were like a few weeks away from Forbidden Door at that point. Not for a few weeks, but like about a couple months off and then double or nothing. But at that point, I had finished college. I had left a job that was taking up so much in my life. Like, and I was like, suddenly had all this free time on my hands. And so I just re-engaged with wrestling and like AEW was like that number one. And like, obviously I had seen a lot of it already, mm. but it was just like finally being able to like engage and like really do it as a fan. Like I feel like I had mm. only I hadn't been able to be like an involved fan. And so that year I was going through a lot. I was really depressed. Um and wrestling really saved me during that point. And like between AEW and I would say Pure Wrestling, Japanese wrestling. So I just start traveling nonstop. And I went to full gear 2022. That was my first time, like, ever traveling for wrestling, like, outside of just whenever, you know, WWE mm. or AEW came to my hometown. And I was hooked. And, like, the year after that, I just, I turned 25. I said, you know what? I never did this wrestling thing before. I never gave it a, a real shot. So I said, I'm going to give it a real shot for a year. We'll see what happens. So I traveled all over the world. I went to Wembley, went to Seattle for Wrestle Dream, went to L.A. for Full Gear, <laughs> what you're talking about. So, it's really cool. Um, that's that's essentially my road to AEW specifically. How that happened? Yeah, that's awesome. It's it's so interesting to hear how you sort of journey into it. There's a lot of people I've talked to who sort of have that had that engagement with Cody. Um, and of course, if you had started watching wrestling in early 20, 2006, like that would have been around. That would pretty much have been around about the time Cody first showed up and then of course yeah. was in legacy yeah. um early early 2010s sort of battling his way in the middle cut in the mid card and then yeah so you pick and then double or nothing 2019 of course that's like cody's greatest ever moment you know it, yeah, until you know yeah. arguably until this year earlier this year where he you know finally gets that wwe championship so um yeah what a what a great way to get into it and then you know it's so interesting hearing how you traveled so much for it. It's uh, for someone who's on the other side of the world and I'm getting excited to go to my first show uh, in February next year <laughs> and has That's been following the promotion. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very jealous, but also I think it's, it's awesome that you've been just, you like dove in so hard and, and not just, I should, I should say not just AEW as well. Like you are um, very well rounded in, in knowing a lot about what's going on in not just new Japan, but in, uh, a lot of the puro circles as well, Lyric. Yeah, I, you know, and I will say AEW was a launch point for that, of just mm. kind of expanding my knowledge of what's out there um, and, like, being aware of what's out there. I remember, like, mm. a big reason why I got into Japanese wrestling was Eddie Kingston. And, yep. like I said, like, during that summer of 2022, I was so depressed. And I was working from home, so, like, I was... Like, I, I don't know if like I should be proud of this or not, but, you know, it all worked out. But I was literally at home 24-7 for about three, four months straight. And the only thing that I would do is, like, watch hours and hours and mm. hours and hours of old school wrestling, of just wrestling. Mm. Just hours and hours and just study. And just, and, like, at, at that point, I'm just a fan. I would never even thought about, like, content creation. Like, at that point, I'm just, like just watching stuff because like, you know, it felt like medicine almost and like yeah, really dive into this stuff. And so like, yeah, AEW was a launch point for stuff like that of me being aware. And I just remember like, that's why I would say it's probably maybe will always be in my top five pay-per-views that first mm -hmm. forbidden door changed my life. Like just completely changed my life of just like having like this rabbit hunger of just like, okay, wrestling is so much bigger than what I thought it could ever mm. be like. Of course, I was aware of some some stuff like you know that happened before, but to like finally have the time to pursue it and like really dive deep of just like it was like I feel like I couldn't have have enough. I still feel like I haven't had enough. Like I want to go everywhere. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the attributes I really appreciate about AEW. Sometimes I wish they would be you know like diehard fans of their own history a little bit more. Um, but I I, I do love how as a promotion, they are so open 
to promoting the history of wrestling outside of AEW. Um, yes. You know, of course, there's the Ring of Honor stuff, um, which is very prominent. Uh, probably partially because Tony Khan owns it. But the New Japan, of course, says that there's like a direct link between New Japan and AEW because of how, you know, the elite sort of came to prominence in wrestling. Uh, and then but then there's also been, you know, a lot of the, the history through the through the guise of Eddie Kingston into all Japan and um, some of the other now Kanote Takeshita. We're seeing that like DDT and we've got all of the Joshi who've who've been influencers and in and out a little bit, but influencers as part of it. And now there's this tie with there's always been a tie with AAA, but now with CMLL as well, which I mean, I don't know a whole lot about Lucha, so I'm I'm definitely not someone who is even a even a rookie um, <laughs> rookie in terms of knowledge. Uh, but it seems like CMLL is is more like the what I'd call like the diehard traditional Lucha uh, Libre compared to AAA, which seems to be um, a little bit more of like the Wild West of Lucha Libre. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I love that AEW is a like a celebration of all of that. Um, and, and and coming together and a platform for all of that, uh, and that they are never shy in promoting other what other people have done, what other companies have done in their past. I agree. Yeah, I think, and it's also a point where because they have to, in mm. in the sense of when you think about who their top stars are, right? Like you mm. know, like you have Kenny Omega, you have John Moxley, you have Kazushika Okada, you have Will Ospreay, mm. you have these guys to where you can't talk about them without talking about where mm. they've been. Brian yep. Danielson, right? Nigel McGuinness. You can't talk about mm. them without talking about Ring of Honor. You can't talk about those previous guys I mentioned without talking about New Japan Pro Wrestling. Yep. Um, even like a, a, a place where it's even more evident, right? The women's division, Deanna mm. Perrazzo, Tony Storm, Mariah May, you can't talk, Jamie Hayter, you can't talk about them without talking about stardom. You can't yep. talk about Swerve Strickland without talking about Killshot and Lucha mm. Underground, right? Like, um, I love, I think that's why for me personally, I've been able to connect more with the characters because these are people you can literally follow their career Hmm. back because the company is acknowledging it. You can go back and follow their career years and years and years and like, and they can use that, right? And feuds of just Hangman Omega, you know, pulls on like, you know, emotions that had been brewing since like, you know, G1 from what 2016? Yeah. Things like that. You know, it's so many, it's so many different layers that I think like it's just so important to wrestling. Like Young Bucks, we talk about like P the like the PWG influence, Eddie Kingston, Shakara, mm. uh, you know, Claudio too. Um it's just so many different layers. Takesha DDT. Um, and so for me as a fan personally, I feel like AEW is a gateway into loving wrestling as a whole so much more Mm, indeed well look we we could probably talk about this for much longer but we need to get (laughs) on to um, at least the build to the match that we're going to talk about today uh so of course this is the sort of the second episode that i've done in, in terms of chronicling the rise of swerve strickland in AEW. Last episode of Fortnite, a guy spoke to Sam Roberts about Swerve and Keith Lee against the Acclaimed, and we spoke pretty in-depth about Swerve's debut and his first year or so in the company. Um, but, Lyric, I'm I'm interested in getting your thoughts on Swerve Strickland. Like, when did you first see him? Uh, what were your first impressions of him? And what did you think of that initial time of his in AEW? So my first time seeing Swerve was after he debuted in AEW. Truly, I yep. wasn't really familiar with his NXT stuff or his Lucha Underground stuff. Um, so he started on a fresh slate with me. Um, and I think originally, like, I liked what I saw. I don't think I was, like, super, like, oh, my gosh, this, this is the future world champion. Mm. Um, for a minute, I like, you know, they put him in a tag team. I thought he was really cool with swerving our glory. But at that point, I was more familiar with Keith Lee. Than him. So, like, if you had asked me in 2022, who's going to be the star? If one of these people is going to be the first black mm-hmm. AEW world champion, I would have said Keith Lee. Mm. Uh, and then they get deeper into the Swerve and Our Glory thing. I'm like, no, Swerve is like really good. Like, he's really good. And then what really changed things for me actually wasn't the acclaimed match because I, I obviously that was fantastic, you know, at All Out and then, you know, eventually the rematch of Grand Slam. But really, like, 
shift turned a corner for me on Swerve was I was in the building for Ring of Honor Final Battle 2022. And ah, so yes. Him and Keith Lee against Shane Taylor. Yeah. 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 And so I was there at that tag match, and I was like, outside of FTR Briscoe's three, which is obviously, you know, all-timer there, and then you have the night she won the title, which was also super special to see. When it came back to, like, when I think of that show, I think of that match, that tag match, that I, I was like, Swerve's a storyteller. And that was, mm. for me, like, my favorite wrestlers are, you know, the Kenny Omegas, the Hangman Pages of the world, like, these long, drawn-out, now, like, I'm an elite fan, you know? So, like, these long, drawn-out storytellers with attention to details. And I think that that was the night it clicked for me. I was like, oh, Swerve is one of these people. Like, I think he, or, and if, and if he's not fully there, he's going to be one day. Um, so that was really kind of, like, my introduction to Swerve and I think like the day he really turned the corner was when I saw that um, Ring of Honor Final Battle 22. But I don't think I became like a a real Swerve fan until this particular feud. Yeah. Uh, Hangman Swerve, yeah. Yeah. Um, coming out of that Keith Lee partnership, what did you think his kind of ceiling was in the company? And what did you think of like his initial direction as a singles wrestler outside out out of that Keith Lee? partnership i knew swerve was going to be special because swerve was hungry in the sense of he was doing the things that nobody else wanted to do and i think that was a time where you got to think the leaks were coming out left and right (laughs) about people who are unhappy that you know they wish they should be pushed more you would never hear hear anything from him but you would always see swerve was booked he was working Mm. last minute replacement you know for triple mania He's working with all the partner promotions. He's doing all this, like, you know, this outside stuff. And at the point, it got to a point where it was just like, why is he doing this? Like, it's like people who actually have championships who aren't doing media and stuff. Like, I was really, like, baffled. Like, why is he doing all this stuff? And I, like, you, you, and that was at the point, you know, AAA was already on the decline. It was just a whole, it, the fact that he was even doing some of this stuff was proof. I was like, oh, he really wants this. And I think, like, the best thing that you can always do as a wrestler is be useful. Mm. Um, And I I think that guys like Samoa Joe and Christian Cage are always going to be, I would say, the best examples of this, of being useful. Mm. Like, uh, of how can you always have value, even in the upper years of your career? And Swerve has that potential. And And then I would look at his podcast, and you'd see... He's sitting down with Kenny Omega. He's sitting down with the Bucks. They don't do interviews. They don't. Like, they don't mm. They don't really do anything, those things anymore. And so it's just like, okay, if these guys believe in him, like, he's probably going to be somebody, like, mm. fairly soon. And even in the spots that he was put in of at all in, you know, being – he put with that Sting match. Like, that, I, I think that, that that spoke volumes of just – it kind of reminds me of – if those years in WWE where the Undertaker match felt almost as important as like, you know, a main event. Mm. And I know, that, you know, for Tony with his relationship with Sting of like, I know in his mind that anybody who's working Sting, Sting and Wembley Stadium has to be pretty important, like pretty important. And like when I was in that building, I was in Wembley. Swerve probably got top five pop of that night, and I was not expecting that at all. Mm. It's like I expected, of course, yeah, like this is going to be cool, especially you're up against Sting. He just came out to seek and destroy by Metallica, and Swerve still got one of the biggest pops of the night. Mm. I was like, okay, he's going to be a superstar. Something I've really liked about Swerve is you can see him tinkering and doing the work and constantly seeking to improve in real time. Um, so like if you, you know, you look at him, he kind of, he came in and he said he was a mogul and this is like initially even before the Keith Lee stuff. And he, he said he was a mogul and he, he sort of was working out what his, his direction was going to be. And then he gets out of this Keith Lee program and you can see he's got a mind of like, he's got a character arc in mind. He's always thinking about the long-term character arc that he's, his character has got in the, in this company. He gets out of that and he's got the mogul affiliates 
uh, and yeah. they had uh, Trench and Parker Boudreau uh, uh, as his associates there. And even so, he's like, I, I don't like, I have, I don't have any inside track on this, and I can't even remember anything coming out about it. But you got to think that wasn't exactly the presentation he had in mind but he's like okay doesn't matter we're gonna make it work he he'd like put hoods up uh, and that became like something he'd be doing at that point put the hoods up and and the way that they presented themselves and would would slightly change every now and again uh and then uh, of course it didn't work out with those guys i think um one of them got injured the other one just it just didn't work out uh and he's he's sort of constantly Change, he's changed his theme, like the the way his theme song works. He's changed the pace of it at one point um, yeah. to a, a slightly slower bit, which I, I not many people have picked up on. But that's like a key element because then the the real key thing happens when mogul affiliates and the embassy become one, and Swerve and Nana form this partnership, and that that's where the magic hits. That like that's the moment where it's like okay bang that one works but that doesn't happen if he's not constantly tinkering and looking for different ways to improve listening to what the crowd's thinking and picking up on um working on his promo game in particular working on his presentation uh and then of course it hits and the magic starts when he forms this affiliation with prince nana absolutely and i think another big thing is like to just be honest about that was one of my how do i say this delicately as a black wrestling fan, I am always very cautious whenever a black talent starts to be pushed because I we, I've we i seen enough times in almost 18 years as a wrestling fan of it resulting in nothing or if one thing goes wrong, you're cooked. If you're not 100% perfect, like as far as like, you know, of how thing, the crowd are reacting to certain mm. things or things like your push can be snatched. And so like when mogul affiliates didn't work, I was like, Oh man, uh, this sucks. Mm. I, I don't know who knows. So, and, but when they pivoted and still kept trying something else, I said, Oh, they genuinely care about his development. And I'm mm. like, okay, like they, that I think was one of the first signs of just because like, I was just like, maybe this is going to kill it all of, because sometimes it really is that simple. Mm. One thing that's worked, how many guys, and not even just black talent, I'm just like, guys at AEW have just tried different things and it just doesn't work. Like, it just doesn't, people don't react to it. And they kept tinkering. And like you said, the theme music slowing down, the addition of Nana, the mogul affiliate, like the mogul embassy. And then they just kept, because one of the things is, Swerve was not a great talker when he came to AEW. Mm. Not at all. And no. I think that, it's been mind blowing how much he's evolved in that aspect of because that was originally I think one of the things that the faction was supposed to do I think he needed a mouthpiece to a certain point and then it molded and I then it evolved essentially into he's gonna talk but he still needs to be surrounded by people he still needs muscle and then he needs this manager and then it's completely evolved into an act to where this is like I can't even ex put him and Nana's relationship into like anything we've seen before because Swerve is fully speaking for himself, mm. but he's also has an efficient, mo uh, an I mean an incredibly efficient manager mm. who has captivated crowds, and I think the, his manager's charisma forced him to like change up the song honestly quite a bit to like make it more I think palatable for the live audience especially as it relates to Nada Nana and his antics mm. it's just been a fascinating evolution in my yeah. opinion and uh just another one I thought of with you know how he's changing and we'll we'll have to move on to hangman quickly but um, I just thought like you know what happened with AR Fox is an example yeah. of how he just takes his lumps like that was a perfect partnership when when ar fox joined i was like that is the that is the act like they have got the act perfectly and then whatever happened happened with ar fox um and you know you can go into the backstage politics if you want but you know in the end this thing that seemed like it was so good to go had to get nixed and and tony khan wanted to nix it because of uh for like to discipline fox for for what happened and in the build-up to the wembley match with sting and Swerve just took it in his stride. Like it didn't, it didn't even seem to affect him, which is amazing. Because as you said, like sometimes 
this kind of thing could completely derail the whole act and you know it would be like okay well you know two years time we're thinking oh what could have been if this hadn't gone wrong for swerve but he took it in his stride and he, he just kept on going uh and yeah uh, the build up to you know the, the point that we've got you know he, he's a guy who kept kept taking these losses in his stride but was able to continually stay on tv and and use his willingness to like be a team player to take the lumps to do the things that other people didn't want to do like have a, a feud that he lost with orange cassidy be the one that lost to sting um and lost to darby allen he was willing to do to do all of that and was able to get himself into a position where come come the time to to face you know a main event like hangman page and and get his chance the crowd had seen him and were used to him uh, and I'll I'll use that that uh, that segue to bring in Hangman Page, because um, Hangman Page in 2023 heading into this Swerve feud, he's a really really interesting point in his career. Um, of course, I, I spoke about Hangman Page. I've spoken about hang, about Hangman Page a lot on this podcast because like the story of him is basically the story of AEW, the ups and downs and, and, and all of that, the tryouts and the you know the the difficult points. Um, He's probably one of the people I've spoken about most on this. And I, we kind of, myself and Trish spoke about uh, the start of his year um, a, a few months ago where we talked about the the feud with Moxley. Um, but 2023, it was a very up and down year for him. Um, he started it really strong with that feud with Moxley. Um, but, and was kind of a bit of a focus for the elite early on in that the thing with BCC. He was almost the leading man for the elite in their feud with BCC. But then... After blood and guts happened, it, it seemed to he ceased to seem being a focal point um, all through all in and all out. Lyric, what did you make of Hangman's 2023 leading up to his first interaction with Swerve? I know you said earlier that he's one of your favourite wrestlers, um, so yeah. I, I'm sure you've got thoughts of what his 2023 looked like. Yeah, um, I think 2023, like you said, it started off strong. I think especially him coming off of like that concussion and that that. The Mox feud was everything. Mox is also one of my all-time favorites, and so you got good, you got good taste, Lyric. You've come to the right man, podcast to say know? these things. <laughs> uh, you know, man. Um, and I think it was just I love that entire feud, and then we went into the elite BCC stuff, which I also like really enjoyed. Like the elite and BCC comprised like at least like forty percent of like my favorite wrestlers, at least American wise. So like, um. That was a treat, but I, it was very clear, I think, at that point in the con- in the company of just, in my opinion, at that time, the elite BCC stuff, the Hangman Mock stuff was carrying the AEW product for me. I wasn't mm. interested in much else. I was not happy with the world title picture. And it also was very clear, too, it's like, it felt like there was no plan for any of these people past, mm. past that. And I think like they ended up carrying double or nothing. I feel like the in they it, it felt, and I don't want to say they were checked out, but I just think that even elite fans were more so checked out. It felt like 2023, we had gotten so far away from what AEW was supposed to be to the point mm. where I think that a lot of people were watching out of habit rather yep. than genuinely being invested. Yeah. And I think, go ahead. Let, let's just say this. It felt like there was a political ceiling placed over the top of the elite, the elite at that point. 100%. 1,000%. 1, I think especially when, you know, the collision and all that stuff, it just felt like for the elite and I think especially for Hangman Page. Because at the end of the day, Kenny Omega is Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks are the Young Bucks. But Hangman Page is, what, 33, 34 years old? Like mm. 30, maybe 32? Um, he, he doesn't. He's not there yet in the sense of he has like this. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. His body of work is incredible, but he's so young. Like he he does. He's not Teflon like the rest of them. Like mm. Kenny Omega and Young Bucks could retire today and have nothing to prove. Hangman Page is not in that boat. They could um, have retired in 2023. Like they could 1, have finished years. that blood and guts match, retired, and they would have Hall of Fame careers. And that was really my fear, too. Like, honestly, I know, like, I never really worried about them going to WWE. I was more so worried about it. I was like, I'm worried they might hang it up. And, mm. and I think that Hangman, especially being in this, that version of AEW, it was very clear that 
And I've personally been going back and I've been rewatching the Hangman Omega feud, like from the very beginning, like from the from the like the first AEW press conference. And you watch that and you see that the plan was always for Hangman to be the face, the heir mm. of all of this. And so like by the time we get to 2023, it's very clear we have fallen very far. And I think there was a lot of fear there and there's a lot of uncertainty. And then, you know, you get to all out and I'm like, he's on the pre-show. Like, what are we doing? We get to all in, you know, the six man tag, like it just felt like he was being thrown everywhere. And then we get to that dynamite after all out. And then here comes Swerve. And it felt like, okay, Mm. come hell or high water, things are about to turn around. And as a real hangman fan, like I was excited and I felt like, Mm. This was also a chance for Hangman to prove that I believe that to that point, I think Hangman had already had the two best feuds in the company history, in my opinion. Yep. And Hangman Omega and Hangman Mox. But I don't think that he had ever been able to prove, could he do it alone? Could Mm. he hold a feud up, a rivalry up that will stand this test of time that isn't connected to the elite in any way? Or like, someone you know, who's already a, a big, like Moxley, who's a, you know, an all-timer star. Um, like, but I think, probably the most pushed guy in AEW. But I think even the Mox feud is connected to the elite, right? In the sense of yeah, Mox was first one of Kenny's biggest rivals. Mm. He's been one of the Young Bucks' biggest rivals when he was teaming with Eddie Kingston. And then eventually, what does the Hangman Mox feud evolve into? Elite versus BCC, right? Mm. Hangman had never had a feud that I felt was completely independent of the elite shadow Mm. until this. And I think that he needed to prove that he could do it. And I think that he, I think that he has, um, I do think that now swerve is like forever in that elite verse. I think like, I like, that's what I like to call it. Like the elite verse. Like obviously these people are not members of the elite, but those people who have always will be like adjacent, like the Mox is like Okada before he actually joined or hmm. there's always, and now I think Swerve is now one of those people. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, I think that he needed to prove that he could do it. And hmm. I think that this was the perfect opportunity. Well, you've set the scene, you've dressed the table. Let's get into it, Lyric. Let's get to this, to this feud. We're going back right from the start. So we're going to go through the, the, the start, the wrestle dream match, and then we'll, we'll dig really deeply into the actual match itself. But uh, let's get to the feud. Um, of course, it starts after all out. Uh, first one, it's on dynamite on the 6th of September. And as you said, hangman's been in the pre-show <laughs> battle Royale, which is one at all out to win $50,000. And he he's on the mic with Tony Schiavone. And he says he's donating the funds to Chicago public education fund. He was a teacher once. He looks so happy lyric. It's beautiful. He did. Um, that's yeah, going to change. Did. That's going to change. Um, but as he's mid mid stride in his promo saying, he's going to talk about what he wants to do this year swerves music hits um and out comes swerve to face to go face to face with the hangman um swerve kind of approaches it gets says that he's being in a coffin will give you clarity and perspective um and when he got out the first person he thought of was hangman he said AEW was started when AEW was started hangman had been cherry picked to be the franchise player the company was built around him and he was made AEW champion but now Swerve says he's lost his confidence, he's lost his spine, and he asks Hangman if he even wants it anymore. Swerve says Hangman hasn't had new gear in nearly a year, he's got no new merch, uh, and he says that you can see he's been eating good and it's showing. Um, he says he doesn't have a singles match or promos on Dynamite anymore. He's taken a backseat to the elite and he has gotten comfortable. Um, and then Swerve says if he has had the opportunities Hangman had, he would be the first black AEW champion by now. Um, and then there's a little bit of back and forth, but in the end, Swerve says it's a shame that Hangman's wife and kids have to see their man walk away from his responsibilities, which gets Hangman to uh, get back in in uh, Swerve's face. Uh, but Brian Cage takes him out to sort of finish the segment. Whew, Lyric, talk about saying the quiet part. We were just sort of skirty around. Talk yeah. about saying the quiet part out loud and in front for everyone on live national TV. I felt 
I felt exhilarated during that entire thing. I think that was the first time that, like, in a long time where AEW TV, one of the rare times in 2023, I think, to that point to where I felt exhilarated. Like, just like, this is... This is the wrestling I love, but also I think as an elite fan, it was proof that, okay, they, so they know what's happening, right? Like, so we're not going to ignore this. Like, I felt like for a while, like we had to ignore that all, a lot of these things were happening. Like, I'm glad, like, so we're being honest about it. Like, we are going to acknowledge, acknowledge mm. that, like, you know, the elite and like more specifically hangman have like been like an afterthought. Like I, it was like, like you said, saying the quiet part out loud, um, and I think that in that moment, even though he said it in a very mean way, Swerve was the voice of a lot of us of just like actually, because when you say it, when you, it's just like when you hear it all broken down out loud, it sounds crazy. Like of just like he went from literally being the face of the company to on pre-show battle royals. What are we doing? Mm. Like, what are we doing here? But it's also, it was that hunger that I, I think that like that Swerve brings. And I think that that hunger, that hunger that we know that, hangman has but i think that it had gotten dampened out and i think for him at that point in your career like how could you stay excited you know like how do you mm. stay excited after you know um everything that had happened to that point but i felt that we had seen it just felt fresh and i think like that was mm. personally something that I, i've been looking for i had been looking for i think that a lot of people have been looking for because we had seen the rivalries with all these, I felt like intergenerational stuff, right? Like we mm. saw Omega and Hangman, two completely different points in their career. We saw MJF Punk, two completely different points in their career. We see even Hangman Mox, two completely different points in their career. It was cool to see two guys who are, even though Hangman had been world champion before, honestly, he, so much damage had been done, I think, to his character to the point where him and Swerve were equals. At that mm. point, I think they still are. Um, definitely now. Um, and if so, it, I think seeing that type of feud between two guys around the same age, on the same level, same hunger, same, you know, th- this is like the next at least 10 years where we're, we're watching something that we can see at least probably for mm. the next 10 years. I think that was really cool. Yeah, and I I, I, uh, I love the the tone that swerve has and the contrast that there is you've got kind of happy hangman um you know and and then swerve coming out really sinister and really dark and that that like that tone for hangman is going to change but at the start here he's very he is actually comfortable he seems happy in his thing he's like you know i was in the pre-show but i'm still doing good i'm um but swerve comes out and he is just like this darkness um that that descends into the segment you know he like shoes shivoni nana shoes shivoni away and is like get out of here we're gonna do business now um and and i love how like swerve is just always needling and always trying to get personal um and and make things and get in his opponent's head like at one point hangman goes oh I, if you want to fight we'll go go to the back and organize a match and he goes to walk away but then swerve says that line about his wife and kids like swerve it's not just enough for swerve to like set something up he's got to like needle and really dig in um and uh, and and you can see as you said like that hunger um and that drive it's it's part of like obviously him as a real person he is obviously like clearly one of the most like driven wrestlers we've seen. You can see that in everything he's done, the way we're talking about, the way he's changed his body. Um, like this is a yeah. guy who is singularly driven to become the greatest wrestler in the world. Um, but his character as well, like takes everything as a personal slight against him. And the fact that Hangman exists is a former champion and he's happy with his position is a slight against Swerve. Um, and he wants to make things very personal. Um, but Lyric, one question I wanted to ask before we move on to kind of like the the build the the wrestle dream match um, is how did it feel to hear Swerve talking about opportunities um, that black men or women do and don't get in wrestling? Oh, whew. it felt different. I, I think that's just the best word that I can use. It, it just felt different because like it was saying the quiet part out loud. Obviously, these are things I've been thinking about since I started watching wrestling. To say it is different i think also even to say it to people like that like i said like one of my also favorite wrestlers like it was just a different experience to hear but it's welcome because like i feel like these are the things that should be talked about like 
everything feeds into your character of who you are and like and like your culture everywhere you come from i think it all is related and i feel like the way that they did it while still it's very tasteful and there were so many times during that feud i was just like okay like this could go wrong if they don't play it right but they always played it right and i i, I really appreciate it but i think that it was great and I, another point too I, like even going back when you were saying about like hangman was happy I'll push back on that. I don't think he was. I think it would kind of went back to what Swerve th- was saying of just like, I don't even think he was comfortable. I think he was kind of like defeated. I think he was more yeah. so of like, okay, this is my role now. Putting up okay. a facade. At least I can, you know, I can get money Good for point. kids. Mm. You know, like I feel like I'm just this. And the thing is, Swerve chose him because he knew, like, it, I think even – we focus on a lot of the bad stuff that was said there, mm. but there's something really important says that that was said in there. And I think that it's been like a really recurring point in this feud is that Swerve sees him as the guy. Mm. He, he sees Hangman as the guy. He didn't go to MJF. He didn't go to, you know, anybody else. He didn't go to Darby. He didn't go to, at that point, he didn't go to Jungle Boy. Like he didn't go to one of the pillars. He went to Hangman because he sees Hangman as the guy. Any interview that he's done, he said, like, Hangman is the main character. He sees them as the guy, which is why he was so appalled when he's doing anything less than. Um, it's like it's been a recurring part, in this, and we'll talk about this later, but Swerve genuinely believes there's, like, there's, um, it's like a twisted, demented fondness there. Swerve genuinely believes he's doing this for Hangman. Mm. You know, and when you look back and over the entire feud, it's hard to say he's wrong. Yeah. And I think you're right there with what you've said about Hangman because I'm <laughs> just looking at my notes and literally like in a couple of weeks, I sort of go back and forth a little bit, but a couple of weeks time, Hangman goes out and he says, um, you know, that he thanks Swerve for, think, for, for pointing it out. Um, and he says deep down he knew something was you know, not right there. Um, and that for a year and a half, every day he went to work, it felt like he was, there was a little black cloud over his head that he couldn't get rid of. And even when the sun shone, every time he started to smile, the cloud would come back and it would start to rain again. Um, but he weathered the storm and he's still here. Um, yeah. So I think you're right. You're absolutely right. That like he is trying to make the best of where he's at, but he is in a, you know, like a state where he is not happy overall with how things are. Absolutely. At the start of all this. Um, did you have anything to say about the the promo, the other promos or the lead up to Wrestle Dream lyric? I just loved it. I just yep. I just loved it. I'm trying to remember what happened uh, between the Wrestle Dream and Full Gear. It's mostly like back and forth. Uh, the, oh, the contract the Bucks sign. And the Bucks, yeah, the Bucks and, and mm-hmm. Hangman win the – ROH Trez titles from um, Cage and Bishop Con and Lit Toliona. And then there's that contract signing, which we're talking about. And there's, there's like some great lines in that as well. Like Swerve has one. He goes, what's a farmer to a mogul? Uh, what's a cowboy to an outlaw? And what's a buckshot to a kill shot? Which is, is a line that I just love. Like you can see that development. Well, as I a remember that forever. Yeah. And I think that's when I realized too, of just like, this is an iconic feud. Like we're going to remember that forever. What's a buckshot to a kill shot? People are going to talk about that forever. I'm yep. just like, I'm not even like looking at any notes or anything, and I'm always gonna remember that. Um, yeah. Even down to Hangman stabbing him in the hand. Yeah. Like a, the contract shine, signing of just like they elevated every single traditional wrestling trope, which I loved about that of just all of the stuff that we've seen before. They took it to a different level, and mm. they reinvented it to the point to where this is them. Like. Eh, when you see certain tropes, when you see certain things happen in wrestling, you will always associate these two people with it, mm. um, which I think is cool. Yeah, and in the lead up to Wrestle Dream, I guess like the scene is set for the Wrestle Dream match with Hangman sort of acknowledging that he hasn't been everything hasn't been right with him. It's kind of very similar to what he said to John Moxley a year or so earlier um, in in that promo that goes viral every three months or so on Twitter, where he says like the meds aren't working and I'm depressed and I'm anxious, but I'm still here. He even says that line, I'm still here again, um, which, you know, there's, there's a certain person who's not there anymore at this point in all out uh, uh, post post all in 2023. There's a certain black cloud that is no longer in AEW that, you know, maybe mm-hmm. things will actually start to get better for the hangman. Um, but he he sort of promises that the crowd will get more from him at Wrestle Dream. Um, 
but uh, he's going up against a character that is is dark and wants his spot and will stop at nothing to get it um, going into the Wrestle Dream match. We're not here to talk in depth about the Wrestle Dream match, but I did watch it in the the lead up to this, and I know Lyric, you've you've looked at it recently. What do you, what were your thoughts on the match itself? Oh man, oh man, um, it was special. And I think as a person who was there that night, man, it was special. Mm. Of just that reaction, I think. That reaction that Swerve got was, I'll never forget it, of just, like, in Seattle. And, like, even the night before, in the collision taping, I remember we were in line, like, just waiting for doors to open. And, like, they're doing, like, whose house, Swerve house chants before anybody gets in the building. Like, before, like, fans are just doing it everywhere. Um, I think it was, I think it was Swerve's birthday, too. He wasn't even scheduled for that car. <laughs> For the collision car, but they still had to bring him out, like, before, like, the cameras rolling so, like, the crowd could see him because, like, they, they, they wanted to see him. I mean, obviously, hometown reactions are always, you know, typically better, but, like, this was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And I think, like, even seeing Hangman up against, like, come in to, like, such a hostile reaction, I said, oh, my gosh, I never seen. It was just absolutely poetic, and I think that like I said, like it was cool seeing their youth in the sense of these are two guys like who are still writing their stories mm. in real time. Like not saying that the Kenny Omegas and the Brian Danielsons of the world are not still writing their stories, but these are two guys who are literally still in pursuit of becoming mm. land legendary. I think that the the home crowd being so far so behind Swerve um, really plays into this feud where swerve is saying you're the main character the one that this promotion's been bought behind i'm going to take your spot what's happening now the crowd's behind me not you like it it, it sort of plays into that dynamic that they've been setting up um and and obviously like the match there's just the the incredible physicality and chemistry like these two had never wrestled before but their timing is just spot on um hangman's like immediately able to keep up with the sort of weird things that swerve does he's got like some more unorthodox moves which don't always work with every wrestler like sometimes they you know someone's standing there looking a bit awkward while swerve does his moves um but hangman immediately is on the same page as him uh and of course it, it ends with um, Swerve not being concerned with Hangman being injured um, and being able to get the advantage that way and then ultimately Prince Nana cheating to get him the win. Yeah, a really fantastic match. Probably one worth digging into at some point on this podcast even. Um, but we're, we're here to um, talk about the Texas death match, so we need to to move on from that. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the Wrestle Dream match lyric before we uh, uh, continue on in this journey? I think the only thing about the Wrestle Dream match I would say is that I felt like that was one of those rare matches of like, obviously, it's always a process for a wrestler to really elevate to that next level. But that Texas death match, not a Texas death match, but the Wrestle Dream match was the like most evident experience of watching a wrestler step up a tier in real time. Like it felt mm. like Swerve's coming out party. It genuinely did. It felt like it was his uh, introduction to the main stage. It wasn't the main event, but mm. it felt like the main event. And at the same time, it felt like Hangman Pages re-coming out party in the sense mm. of and, and obviously we'll see this over the course of the rest of 2023 and like you know but they it felt like they were the shining spot of AEW the pure AEW that I think a lot of people are looking for and they were going to be the flag bearers honestly for the rest of the year yep. at that point to where it kind of felt like we were watching two different shows on one show, and it was very clear that they were going to be like the leaders of that next chapter. And I, I think the only thing that I could, the only match I could really compare to that Wrestle Dream match, it reminds me of is like Willow Nightingale versus Mercedes. I think of just mm. feeling like in one match we watched Willow reach that next tier. And yeah. I think that was what we saw for Swerve at Wrestle Dream. That's a good comparison. That's a good comparison. And look, at this point, you, you sort of said something in there, but at this point, like, this is literally the only thing I care about in AEW at this point in 2023. No, until the this continent is classic. Like, yep, yep. 
Um, and we'll probably talk more about it afterwards, you know, the, the tonal difference um, that these two, from what these two are doing to what other stuff that's going on in the, in the promotion. But um, yeah, like this was for Wrestle Dream for me, this was my match of the night. I know Zack Sabre Jr. and uh, Danielson gets a lot more love, but I, I like this match more. And part of it was because of that, incredible build up that they had um where you've got these two you know really at loggerheads with each other and these great character contrasts and that continues afterwards um swerve attempts to move on because he he got the win so he's he's moving on to take a tnt number one contender match against danielson who also won his match at, at wrestle dream um but hangman he wants justice he interrupts swerve's about to cheat to win he's like you're not going to cheat to win twice in a row not on my watch he he interrupts and and ruins it uh, and then they start to go back and forth with uh, Swerve and Hangman brawling later on that night. A couple of weeks later, uh, we, of course, get the incredible break-in where Swerve goes into Hangman's house. He cuts a promo while he's walking through it um, with Prince Nana. He ends up in front of Hangman's sleeping child. He says, it isn't always you that pays for your actions. Sometimes it's your family. And then he leaves a shirt on the crib and tells the camera, it's so that no one ever forgets whose house it is. Um, and after that, there's more back and forth with Hangman, this time abandoning his uh, the his, the Young Bucks in an ROH six-man tag title defense against um, the Mogul Embassy. When Swerve appears on the stage, Hangman immediately just leaves to attack Swerve Strickland rather than be part of um, this title match that he's got. Uh, and... Later on, on Collision, Hangman says that they're going to have a Texas death match at full gear. Um, and then on the final Dynamite before full gear, they have a face-to-face -face in the ring um, where Hangman dresses down Swerve. He says, you're a grade-A dumbass. You were dumber today than you were two years ago when you got your ass fired. He says Swerve doesn't have it in him to be champ, that he isn't the man who he thinks he is, and that's why his fiance left him, why his kids won't speak to him. So now you can see Hangman getting pulled into this, making it personal, going into like a darkest headspace. Um, and he says... Swerve is a child and he knows because he used to teach children and this Saturday he will teach Swerve the last lesson of his life, the, the lesson that he should never come into his house, um, but that they don't need lawyers because at full gear, Hangman is Swerve's judge, jury and executioner. Lyric, what did you think of the work in between the pay-per-views? Um, I'm particularly thinking of the home invasion, the choice of Texas deathmatch and then the go home promo that I just talked about. Absolutely fantastic. That build to fill full gear for this feud was absolutely fantastic. Cause it had everything. It had the deeply sadistic stuff you had with the the home invasion. You had like the you you had the comedic elements. You had Hangman telling Nana he was going to steal his weed. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't it was say that, but yeah. Fantastic. Like just fantastic. I think like. They were pressing the envelope so much and doing, like, just so much, I think, cool stuff. And I think even, like, how the elite figure into this of just, like, Hangman's obsession with Swerve really started, like, that distance that formed between him and the elite that we eventually revisit, you know, later on. It was so masterful, and a, a part of this view that I think gets underrated because it technically didn't happen to AEW, but I think is one of my personal favorite parts, is the Pro Wrestling Revolver show from that weekend, um, which I had the privilege of being at. Um, in so like the Wrestling Revolver, the Swerve City podcast, which is Swerve's podcast, is actually a sponsor. So like swerves in the middle of the ring. We this night is already a great time, by the way. Like this is like Ronda Rousey and Marina Shafir are teaming up and facing Athena, Billy Starks. Like that was Ronda's first match post WWE. Not saying that like it's anything to celebrate, but there was just a lot of people in the room, like for a lot of different reasons. Like it looked like Mox, a really hot crowd. I've seen videos. Yes, it looked like a real Mox, hot fun night. Mox and um was teamed up with like Sam Callahan that night. That was the First and only time I've ever gotten to see Jacob Fatu wrestle in person. He had a great match with, I think, what was a Masha Slamovich. So it was a fun night. And so, like. Wait, Jacob Fatu had a match with Masha Slamovich? Yeah. Wow. There you go. <laughs> it rocked, too. It rocked. Yeah. 
Um, Continue. Totally off topic, but geez. No, 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 no. That, no, that, that. Match, that match rocks. Seriously. Yeah, it would do. But we, it, like, it was such a fun time. And Swerve gets in the ring. He's, like, thanking everybody for, like, you know, coming out to, like, support Full Gear the next day. Yeah, he's like, y'all think I'm, I'm about to beat Hangman Page, et cetera. Then Hangman comes in. And like he's like just start they start brawling and it's fantastic like because they're brawling at an indie show like it's absolutely fantastic mm. um and it just feels real it made everything feel real like and it's so funny because I was literally standing um I was on the bleachers and so like watching it, I had my phone ready in case anything happened when I saw Hangman come past I said oh my god like they just come because like keep in mind this isn't like a an AEW show or WWE show where you have like this dedicated backstage or nothing like no they're walking through the crowd like you yep. know that you have to see them like this is just like you know random gym and it was just so well done and like Swerve cut a promo afterwards which I think is one of the best promos of the feud and Revolver put it up on YouTube and he's just like it goes back to that point that I was making of Swerve genuinely thinks he was doing this to make him better he was like like you're so it's like why are you doing this he was just like i'm trying to do charity i'm doing charity today and you and you can't even like leave me alone to do that like it's so funny because you gotta think when they started hangman was doing charity yep and he's just like i did this i made you so much better nobody was talking about you until i was talking about you nobody was interested in you until i was interested in you like you like almost like he should thank him and he was just like, I'm going to like put you in the ground tomorrow, yada yada yada. And it was fantastic. Um, and I recommend if anybody hasn't seen that promo, go look at it because he literally cut it in the parking lot. Um, but yeah, like the revolver stuff the night before, it set the scene perfectly of just mm. like it made you feel like in any place in LA, if they saw each other, whether it was a 7-Eleven or a Target, they would burst out brawling. Mm. Yeah, there's a very wild and rabbit feeling that I don't I don't typically get from a lot of TV wrestling because everything feels so, you know, mm. rehearsed a lot of times. It felt yep. very raw. Which yep. I really loved. And one thing that I love about these guys, their attention to detail with character, you mentioned that charity thing like and it, they they both are so good at integrating like what's happening in real life into what into the like this kayfabe story that these characters are going on like it would be so easy for there to be so much wink wink nudge nudge stuff in this where it's like trying to be cheeky with being like oh you got problems in the back there um but they managed to integrate it into the kayfabe story without it breaking down the the sense of we're watching a fictional thing. Um, it's it's just very well blended and very well done. It's something the elite have always done well, and obviously Swerve has picked up on. And and there's so much I like about this this build. Like Hangman when they do the the home invasion, which is something we've seen previously in wrestling. Like particularly, I know there was criticism at the time. Like oh, we're doing home invasions now, are we? You know, like this is a trope of of uh you know the the less sports based. So there was that famous thing, which still gets brought up to this day, which is so dumb to like try and pin on AEW, even at this point of that AEW is going to be a sports based promotion. Um, and you know, that is not something that a home invasion is not something a sports based promotion would have anything to do with. Um, but, but I want to push back against even, because, so go ahead. Sorry. Even so hangman, in the in the windup, he acts like someone whose home has been violated by his enemy. Like he completely loses all rationality at that point. And when he sees Swerve, like he's in a championship match with his friends, but he sees Swerve and he's like, "No, nope, we're brawling. I don't care what I've got going on now. Like we're fighting. That's just happening right now because <laughs> you showed I, up. We're fighting." I, I also think too of just like people have to realize of like, yeah. In the sense, yeah, for sports-based promotions, but we also have seen so many crazy things happen in sports, yeah. like oh, yeah. outside of games in the universe. Of I remember when Matt Barnes was driving what 500 500 miles to go beat Derek Fisher's ass. Like <laughs> I, like, <laughs> I remember all of this about real sports, whether it's NBA or anything. Like 
well, emotions are real. And when people's yep. families are involved, all bets are off and all things are off the table. I think that is the message of just like, yes, they are here to do their jobs. And then guess what? It got super personal. And so now it's getting wild. It's going to yep. reach that other level. And even now, I will say in these post all out conversations, it's even more it's even more evident of just how this is supposed to be processed as art. Yep. And art is meant to make you uncomfortable at times. Mm. And this was meant to make you uncomfortable. You're not supposed to think, oh, my gosh, that's so cute. Look at him mm. in his house. It's so awesome. No, it's supposed to make you uncomfortable. It's supposed to make you think. It's supposed to put you in the shoes of, hey, man, what would I do if this happened to me? If yep. somebody did it in my family, in my child, like th- that is supposed to make you think. Mm. And another thing with art is it stands alone by itself and is great by itself without knowing any of the context around it. But great yeah. art, generally, it gets even richer when you dig deeper and find out the context around it, which I think this this absolutely does. A couple more things I wanted to point out before we get to the match itself. Um, uh, firstly, I love that they chose a Texas death match. It sort of had become Hangman's signature match. He was undefeated in it. He'd beaten Lance Archer and Adam Cole in championship matches, and then he'd beaten John Moxley, who was the other sort of Texas death match king. He beat John Moxley in it earlier that year. So it was sort of set up as like, this is Hangman's signature match. This is the match that he goes into and no one beats him in it because as he says, he's the judge, the jury and the executioner, which is a motif that they will come back to a number of times in this feud. Uh, And I also love just one bit where they've got this stipulation where if they get physical in this face to face, then the match is going to be called off and they're both going to be suspended for the end of the year. And they both want this match to happen. So they're going to stick by it, but hangman goes, Oh, but by the I, I know I can't get physical with you, Swerve, but they didn't say anything about Nana. And he just decks Nana and starts starts wailing on Nana. And Swerve is next to him but can't do anything about it because if he does, then the match is off. And it's just like this it, – it's it's smart, one. But, two, it shows where Hangman's at, head like headspace-wise. He's, like, obsessed with justice. Nana is an accomplice. Nana helped Swerve win that first match. Nana was in that house with him. Nana is equally guilty, uh, and I think that's probably something you should people should uh, keep in mind as we get into this new arc that Hangman's on, where he sort of seems to be um, tracking down all the people that have helped Swerve along the way. But at that point, he was like, "I can still go after Nana, and guess what? You're next to me. You can't do anything about it." Absolutely. Um, I think even at the Revol, it was so in the Revolver promo, like right afterwards, he's like, "They specifically said we can't touch each other, and you came in here like that, and like." Of where to the point where like Swerve was like I don't even know if we can even have the match now because like you you broke it it just was further like yep. I think goes into like what was Hangman's state of mind even though I will say obviously we're not talking about like the future matches when I look back on this build or no and even when you look back on the text this death match I think they hated each other less after the home invasion than they do end up you know, circling back to, like, around All Out this year. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. it's so fascinating because, like, and this is even before the house gets burned down. There's nothing mm. much more egregious things that happen. It's just genuine, like, I guess, feelings just of hate just festering. Like, they hated each other so much less directly after the home invasion, which is fascinating in hindsight. Well, it's particularly Hangman that, is the one that's dragged down in this because Swerve makes it personal immediately. Um, mm. With in that very first promo, he starts bringing up Hangman's wife and kids and stuff. He drags Hangman down um, into that sort of mind space. And whether it's hate or not at this point with Swerve, I don't know. Um, in terms of character wise, because you know Swerve is a is a dirty gritty guy, but he is a guy who wants to use Hangman to elevate himself. Um, but look, we, we, we'll move into the match to discussing the match itself. Um, but before we get into the match, though, I would like to quickly plug the amazing new Social Suplex merch line that we released on Chop Tees. So if you haven't seen it yet, I'd love for you to visit Chop Tees and go to the Social Suplex section. Our merch has been uniquely designed in conjunction with the site to reflect the colorful, the colorful characters of each show on the network. Uh, we've got O&R shirts uh, and hats that are designed to be like the Dream Team outfits. We've got Keeping It Strong Style zip-up hoodies, Tunnel Talk Snuggies, Imp's Adventures teacup, and my personal favorite, of course, my specially designed Match Guide shirt and hoodie. 
the site's owner, Dickie and I, we created it to not just stand out in a sea of bland wrestling shirt designs, but to commemorate the AEW fifth anniversary match guide list we released earlier this year um, with the show's logo on the front and then listing the top 50 AEW matches in the style of a band world tour T-shirt on the back. The thing that stood out to me when I first got my shirt was the quality of the garment. We've all had wrestling shirts that like stretch or fade when you've worn them only a couple of times, but these shirts are made from really high quality materials, so they don't just look great, but they feel great and they last. Uh, at the Social Suplex, we are incredibly proud of this collaboration Collaboration we've done. So don't wait. Head straight to Chop Tees and get yourself some merch that will not just look great, but will help the network as well. And we also like to thank Chop Tees for doing this with us. Uh, let's get into the match, though, Lyric. Uh, as we always do here on the AEW Match Guide, we'll give the match its flowers. Dave Meltzer gave this five of the big ones, five stars, Cage match rated at nine point. It's currently rated nine point six three, which at current um, recording date is the fifth highest AEW match of all time. And when we did the AEW match guide list earlier this year, it also came in fifth. So we did pretty well there, Lyric. It's a it's a match that is well loved, well praised critically, and well deserved. I think. Um, so at full gear, of course, it's in the Kia Forum. Swerve is out first. He's got dancers all around him. Um, Lyric, we talked a little bit about Nana and the presentation of Swerve and the dancing. Um, this is a, a great entrance, a big entrance for Swerve and sort of his, you know, we, we've talked about him stepping up to the main event. This is like a main event level entrance that he's getting, a featured entrance. And I love the the contrast. We need to bring it up. The contrast of how he like slowly moves in uh, and, and looks sinister while Nana dances. It's It's such a great presentation. Absolutely. The balance, man. Like, I think mm. that the, the balance of having like this silly and I think even Nana eventually like, you know, he shows himself not to be just a silly face there uh, eventually. But they just found that balance. He's a hype uh, man. Yeah. It's like he's the hype man, but he's also he does so much. He's a hype man. He's an advocate. He's a manager. Mm. He's a, you know, a friend. Like, I think, you know, even when we get down to, you know, the past couple of weeks when Swerve actually when they he buys the house and talks about all the things that Nana is to him, he can't be quantified in one role. Um, mm. And I think it's just really it, it's just the perfect dynamic of I think they make each other better. It's very obvious that like I think Nana's presence has elevated Swerve's career, but also Swerve's presence has elevated Nana's career. Everybody who has touched this feud in any type of way has come out of it so mm. much better and i think nana should be included in that conversation it probably would be probably the third person most elevated behind hangman and swerve themselves absolutely and he's as as he comes out as they come out nana's bellowing whose house over and over also it's worth noting small note swerve is wearing black and red stripes in homage to terry funk which is very apt given what's about to happen hangman doesn't have an entrance he just rushes the ring he doesn't want to wait for his music and he immediately takes swerve down he immediately power bombs swerve hits the buckshot lariat swerve rolls to the outside and hangman tosses him into some barricades not no messing around at the start here lyric um hangman is frenzied he's here um and he's just being super aggressive and it makes sense from a story point that his blood is boiling and he's just going straight after swerve yeah um i love the fact that they just get the entrance because i was interested to see what they would do there because even like with revolution when hangman was like tipping towards this darker version of himself obviously they they use the ghost riders in the sky the johnny cash song so mm. i was interested in like okay are they going to do that again but then they just did no interest at all which i think is pretty you know fitting um especially after the night before you know they just yep. draw um so it just made perfect sense um i was a fan of that of them just getting right to the action Yep. Uh, and Hangman gets weapons out next. He hurls a chair at Swerve's head, tapes up Swerve's hands, and then he gets out a staple gun and unloads it on Swerve a number of times. Um, and within minutes, <laughs> we're minutes into this match and Swerve hasn't hit a single piece of offense. Uh, Hangman just keeps escalating things. Uh, he has that staple gun. He gets out 
the piece of uh, a piece of paper with some painting on it that Swerve had ripped off the ripped off his fridge, obviously done by his kid, and he staples it to Swerve's face before holding Swerve's head over his mouth and drinking his blood, then spitting it into the air, Triple H style. Larry, what do we even say here? Like Triple the way H- that he was that cool. Yeah, no, he never was. Triple H was looked cool, but he never spat blood into the sky. Like, this is one of the sickest things I've ever seen in wrestling in, like, both the good way of saying and the bad way of saying sickest. This, I just want to say, for there, I have so much to say, but I would like to say that as somebody who was in the building, the this crowd loves it. They love it. was, yes, the crowd loved it, but, like, the men around me were like, ugh. And the women were feral (laughs) it was crazy it was absolutely crazy every woman i know in the crowd what it felt like they had ascended i including me i have probably that was maybe the most exhilarating experience i've ever had as a wrestling fan and that was one of the rare times (laughs) that was one of the rare times i've gone to AEW show pay-per-view in like recent and over the past year and wasn't doing media so, like, I had two cocktails in my hand. It was nuts. I said, oh, my God, when he spit that blood into there, I said, this is legendary. I said, this is the night they become immortal. I said, this is the night they become immortal. This is a cult classic. This is what one of the people are going to talk about this literally for the rest of our lives. This is the night that these men become immortal. Even the staple gun, and I said this um, on my own podcast, Breaking the Feud Down, of uh, what I love about this feud is that in their pursuit of creating something that feels fresh every time that they interact, they use a lot of recurring elements. Mm. And so, like, the staple gun is one of them. The cinder block is one of them. Mm. The barbed wire is one of them. And I think this match is really where a lot of that starts. And yep. I think the staple gun, I love. what I do love by AEW is I think that certain wrestlers – if you have a good enough performance, you'll own whether it's a weapon or mm. a match type. Like, for example, Hangman is the king of the death match. Willow and Stat will always be as- uh, associated with street fights. Like, they'll mm. always be the queens of the street fights. And Swerve will always be associated with that staple gun. Mm. It, it has become like a a recurrent symbol of his career. And I think mm. we saw that again in Blood and Guts, right? And we saw it again yep. in All Out. He, it, him and that staple gun... That was the night that that was the moment where I think Swerve became like just immortal Mm. in the sense of when he like gets up, starts laughing, staples him back, then Mm. staples himself. It's like, oh, and I think it's also you have these guys who are hungry enough to do things that maybe some, you know, veterans towards the end of their career just simply won't do because like. They they want to become legends, and they're I, obviously I believe that they're going to, and so like they want to leave that lasting impression. I think it's this recurring mm. thread throughout this feud of just despite whatever like the hate exists, there's always been this urge to impress each other, mm. to prove to the other man that they are as good as they think they are, but as good as you already think that they are. Mm. Um, and I think that that has been fascinating. Yeah. When it comes to AEW, like, and and violent matches, AEW is really a very maximalist promotion. Like, there's often thumbtacks, chair shots, like, all sorts of violent, violent tables, ladders, all that sort of stuff. But just in this first, like, few minutes of this match, with how it just goes about this violence, they immediately manage to elevate themselves above all of that. Um, both on like a physical level in terms of doing things that like physically we've not seen them do like the the staples and the drinking blood like immediately they're above anything that the promotion's ever done before but also not just physically like personally what this is saying about the headspace of the characters and how personal it is to them like an immediate and story-wise like it immediately elevates it above everything else as well like this is a match that within the first few minutes is immediately on a different in a different stratosphere to to most of everything else that has ever happened in this promotion in wrestling and yeah. as particularly re- american wrestling of just yeah. like you have the best of both worlds you have these great wrestlers but 
like their death match will always feel different than any other death match that ever exists. Like mm. they're not just doing spots to subdue them. They're not just picking yep. out weapons to hit each other with. Like just everything was calculated. Everything had purpose and mm. everything felt intentional. And it felt mm. like, I don't know, it, it, like it's hard to put into words of like, it felt like they were, felt like they're, they were partners. And I think that yep. that's one thing that is, has really shaped in this feud. And I think like, Blood feuds are interesting mm. because, like, I think everybody, quote unquote, loves them. But I think that a lot of times when, like, talent really doesn't click well and they hate each other. And yes, they can make magic together. But I think so much is left on the table because neither person is willing to give, you know, yep. it doesn't want to look weak and like politics get involved. And like, even if things are good, they're nowhere as good as this. they could be. But you can tell in feuds where there's a genuine level of respect there. There's a genuine level of you mm. see the value in the person that you're working with of being willing, let's like to where limits no longer exist. Boundaries mm. no longer exist to the point to where let's do everything. Let's do this. Like we can do absolutely anything. And I feel comfortable enough with you to do that. I think. Did like, say oh, Swerve and Hangman have that? They've got that. 100%. Yeah. And even just in how Hangman, like, is so giving to Swerve in this feud and in this match in in terms of, like, he he is elevating Swerve uh, in how he acts with him. You don't have matches like that with people you don't, I'm not even going to say respect, people you don't like. Like, you just Mm. can't. And And I think that's what separated, for me, like, going back to the women's division, the Willow and Statlander street fight from just about anything else mm. we've seen. Yep. Because you can tell they are looking to elevate each other just as much, if not more, than mm. they're looking to elevate themselves. Yep. And when people, when wrestlers go into it with that mindset, all limits get stripped away. I think mm. Omega and Osprey were a good example too, especially that Tokyo Dome matchup. When you are genuinely looking to elevate the other person just as much as yourself, all the limitations and like the politics and the ceilings, they suddenly disappear and you get to create something completely new. And I think that that's what we saw with them of like drinking blood, spitting it out. Oh, my God. Like this, this. Yeah. You're never going to find that anywhere else. You're not going to find your very few people are going to be willing to do that for each other. And I think like the, this whole feud, especially with you, the, from beginning to end of what's probably the, I don't know if we call out the end of act one or two, I don't know, but <laughs> the end of that act, you, you see, you just, you can't have matches like that. One, let them know, let alone multiple. If that genuine trust is not mm. there. You, you talked about the ebb and flow and the give and take, like the start of this match is just a, a whirlwind from, Hangman Page, but uh, Swerve gets back into things. His his first piece of offense really is he hits a low blow on Page uh, and gets himself out of the tape, uh, and then he gets the Hangman tries to staple him. Um, you mentioned this before, and and Swerve like turns around and he starts to stalk Page down with like this look in his eye that is just demented. He's just like a horror villain. Um, he's not even reacting to the staples as Hangman like does them to his chest and then he turns the gun on hangman and unloads to his face. Um, Lyric, I, I'm not sure if you've seen this match before, but one of my favorite moments in wrestling ever is the 2018 G1 final where Hiroshi Tanahashi gets like beaten down into a corner by Kota Ibushi's palm strikes. Yeah. And then he uh-huh. just like roars out of the corner and absorbs those slaps as he like advances across the ring. Um, and it's a moment that's been, you know, Ele- you know, people have tried to to do it themselves, um, but never never got that level of emotional pathos until this moment. <laughs> never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd see it done with a staple gun of all things. Um, yeah, yeah, like Swerve is just a man who refuses to die. Or he, even, you know, if you take the long-term kayfabe, he's a guy who, who got buried by Sting, and so you can't kill him. He, he's, he's already been dead. You can't kill him again. Absolutely. And I think, like I said, this is one of the, I'm glad you mentioned that match just because like, in my opinion, this is the greatest death match on American soil. And I think that this is one of those that could have held up in like in Japan. I think like mm. this is one of those matches 
because like I think that's one thing that I can't stand about like American deathmatch wrestling of and just American wrestling sometimes I think that we I don't think people understand what fighting spirit actually is and mm. I also think that a lot of times people are throwing around rep- weapons just to do it just for blood pops mm. for whatever and I love there was intention behind everything when Swerve came back it felt like they built to it like and it was like it was like the even like the crowd like when he like starts laughing it's like the, mm, the oh, blood dripping down his face yeah like it's just like the it, the crowd is like oh like the ah mm. like the like the feeling like that we always talk about like this feeling that was that feeling of just like oh like these are he immediately shot up into those immortal characters in the AEW like history that will be forever like I, that was what I think put him immediately in that tier with the Omegas, the Moxes of the world of like, no, Swerve's there. Like he, mm. he, he's there. He's one of them. And when we do these, when we go back and we do like these anniversary videos of AEW and we go back to the drawing board every year and figure out, okay, like, so who, what's still considered the top? Well, who is considered like these mm. franchise players? His name will always be on that list. And I think it really that moment didn't mm. had a lot to do with it. Absolutely. And like at that point, Hangman gets busted open from the staples to his face. Swerve gets out of cinder block. There's a great moment on commentary. Actually. I don't, I don't notice the commentary a whole lot when I'm re when I was rewatching this. Um, Cause I think I was just so absorbed into what's happening, but there was one moment that stood out where Taz goes, you can feel it, after the cinder block comes out, you can feel like something really bad is going to happen. And then Excalibur says everyone here in the forum is holding their breath. And it's like this perfect moment of them just summing up what is going on right now. Um, and you get your first 10 count after Swerve dumps Hangman onto cinder block with a Death Valley driver. And then at this point, like there's that that really fast sprint at the start, but then they pay for the the initial pace um, and things slow down, but it, it suits it um, as the violence like continues to escalate and wears on them that they're now selling it so well. Uh, and then there's a lot of barbed wire spots on the menu. I'm just going to kind of list them out what, what happened. Um, like Hangman rakes it, the barbed wire across Swerve's head, then wraps it around him before slamming him on the ground. Um, Hangman gets some barbed wire, gets a barbed wire wrapped chair, does this moonsault to the outside with it kind of on his body so that it hits Swerve but also gets his body. And then returning swer- sir- <laughs> returning Serve, Swerve kicks the chair into Hangman's face um, before Hangman then hits a pile driver onto the barbed wire chair. Uh, and then finally, like the, the sort of crescendo of it all is Swerve hits Hangman over the head with it and he rips, when he pulls it back, it rips at Hangman's glorious hair. Um, I'm sure that made the ladies swoon as well in the, in the crowd. Um, yeah. And then Hangman power bombs Swerve onto it. Uh, sorry, he power bombs Hangman onto it and then does a Swerve stomp on it and it gets an eight count. Um, I, I just love the usage of barbed wire and how it emphasizes how will at this point how willing they are to punish themselves to deal out damage to their opponent and all of those things I mentioned. Like it's, it's both of them doing damage to themselves to like further inflict pain on 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 their opponent because they've lost all sense of self-preservation absolutely yeah it, it, like the pacing of this match is incredible of like how mm. they like they know when to speed up they know when to slow down and i think also like when you watch the match when you're first watching it and you see the blood drinking spot you're like there's nothing they can do that could possibly make me wince or like jump more than this and they proceed to do it Honestly, you can split the match up into different acts yep. if you really want to of just it's structured like a New Japan epic. To yep. be quite honest, that's really there's how definitely it's three acts. There's definitely three. 100 percent. Yeah, it's structured like, a you know, a three act New Japan epic, which is fascinating for a death match. <laughs> yep. um, and I think death fascinating for like these guys are just like, they start so high. They make you think of how can they possibly top themselves? And then they continue to do it. Mm. I've always admired about hangman page is that he's obviously he's very attractive in the sense of like aesthetically. And so like the way that he hardens his image is by doing like the, craziest 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 things and he pulls it off Mm. like he pulls it off i think like there's some people who can't really get over like 
that pretty boy aesthetic. I think Adam Cole is like probably one of those people. Like a lot of times in like hardcore matches, Hangman always goes over and beyond to prove like he's actually the sickest of them all. Um, and so like even like the his hair getting caught, you know, in the barbed wire and like around his face and. I just always in my and him just always covered in blood because he's just that's just what he does. I've always admired him going that extra that extra mile to always like quiet any of those concerns. I mean, obviously not a concern for me or anybody else like a fan or anything, but mm. you know the criticisms that a lot of people have made in in the past of like, oh, he's just there because like he he's aesthetically pleasing. Like he always takes it to hell, so you know like. No, he's actually earned it. He's he's really just that good. Yep. Yeah. And if this was if you were to divide it up into a three act, that would be what we just covered. You know, the first act is up until the uh, swerve start start stapling himself. Then second, the second act is is sort of where they're going back and forth with barbed wire. And then there's a broken glass that's <laughs> like I didn't even get to um, where he oh, like, swerve God. pours broken glass on the hangman's back before hitting a 450 splash. Like I mentioned that you know willing to deal out <laughs> deal out pain um, and take it yourself to deal out more. Um, and then the JML driver, which only gets a nine count, like it's just you know, Swerve's seemingly inhumane imperviousness to pain in this. Um, but Hangman sort of really gets on top um, when a barbed wire board comes out and the Hangman hits a fallaway slam uh, off the top turnbuckle before doing a powerbomb onto it and then a dead eye. And then he wraps Swerve's head with barbed wire and hits a buckshot to get a nine count. But Nana once again interjects himself, proves his worth as a manager. He pulls Swerve out to the outside and then does a dance in front of him he to inspire. He dances him back to life. Yeah, it's like this weird moment of humour that just fits so well in this completely... And it was incredible! ...match, yeah. Yeah, particularly with how, like, everyone had been going, was so into the dance at that point, and so they, they just in, do it at the perfect time. Uh, and that is a moment of distraction as well, so that Brian Cage can come out and attack home man, hang, Hangman. Um, he pulls out a table on the outside, which Hangman fights Cage off and then manages to dead-eye Nana through that table. Um, but, uh, unfortunately, that is... The distraction that Swerve needed, um, he comes up behind after after Nana's gone through the the table. Um, Swerve comes up from behind. He smashes a cinder block across Hangman's head, and then Swerve gets a chain from under the ring. He wraps it around Hangman's neck and pulls on it before the ref gives the ten count and Swerve wins. Um, lyric that image at the end of Swerve. Going, going from the dance to, to wake him up to Swerve standing over Hangman, having just choked the life out of him. It, it's so, like, dark. It's intimate. It's, like, haunting. It's, like, this is a, a feud that is so rich in imagery, and that is one that I just will never forget. That was the night Swerve hung the Hangman, and I think it's so interesting. Like, there's been so many points in this feud of, I feel like I could immediately foresee how it's going to be written in the history books of like, it, 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 it's it, like, even like it has written, Swerve hung the hangman. Of course, people mm. are going to talk about that, about that forever of just that closing image of like hangman, not even moving until mm. the count of nine. And then he obviously can't get up by then. Like him crawling, Swerve like legitimately like, literally lays next to him passed out and then mm. crawls over him so even to where he gets up to the stage screams on the stage which immediately no not not immediately eventually becomes a parallel to you mm. know all out hangman screaming on the stage yep. and all out of just this match was amazing then when it mm. happened it is 10 times better now mm. in retrospect and in context and I said it then that five stars was very low. Yeah. Even And now I believe that even more. This match, like the tone of it is, mm-hmm. is something I have never, ever experienced before. It's not just like, like I've seen violent matches. Like I, I remember seeing a, um, a nail, 
a nail birthday cake um, <laughs> in a match that's like this insane like death match in Japan. And it was more violent than this, right? But the violent didn't it didn't feel as dark because the it didn't feel as personal. This is so personal in in all this violence is like the intent of it is to maim and to disfigure and there's no sense of self-preservation from either people. It's like this is like a horror story this match. Um like the hero he wants he's lost all sense of his morality almost but he, he's willing to kill. He's still good at this point but he's willing to kill and he's against this villain who doesn't feel like he can be killed at all. He doesn't feel like he can even be hurt. Um, ultimately. Uh, and then like the visual imagery of Swerve, like even when he's hanging Hangman, he's like right down next to Hangman, pulling on the chain um, as he like tries to choke the life out of his opponent. Uh, it's so personal. And like we mentioned, I mentioned before, like I was not paying attention. To, like I didn't care for anything else in AEW at this point. Like at this point, this dark horror show of a match and feud is happening and at the same time like this is the year that mjf and adam cole are doing these ridiculous like trampoline park skits and eating hot asian spicy food skits and adam cole and Rod oh. roderick strong doing these just the worst the worst excesses of sports entertainment skits that aren't even funny like it's not even funny what it's it's just terribly. stupid and They've yeah, aged have terribly. aged horribly. And MJF has had to walk back and basically do like career rehabilitation because of. And and at the same time that that's happening and turning me completely off. Um, and at this pay per view, you've got this ridiculous saga of MJF and and Adam Cole and Jay and Jay White and Jay doing White. Jay White absolutely dirty, horribly, and and treating the AEW Championship with zero reference. I, I nearly turned off AEW if it wasn't for this feud, which is like stands in just complete contrast in how personal it is, how dark it is, how violent and gritty it is, but how also how like well they tell this story of these two characters going at it um, and going head to head with each other. And afterwards, like immediately, like everyone can tell that this is greatness. Like Nigel on commentary says in his mind, this will go down as the most violent and brutal match in AEW's history. And Taz immediately agrees with him. And like these are two people that know they know violence and they know <laughs> darkness. Like, and I think there's maybe only been one match since that's more violent and brutal. And that's also between these two people. Like it, the the imagery of this match, the story that they tell, the darkness of it, the violence. The blood, it's so rich um, to dive into, uh, and it's it's exactly the kind of wrestling that I that I love. Uh, and to me, this feud is one of the greatest feuds that AEW has done, if not the greatest. Uh, you know, if you compare it to, you can compare it to Hangman Omega. You can probably compare it to MJF Punk. In in my mind, like this this is wrestling on another level. I agree. Um, my fa my top three favorite feuds in AEW have all been Hangman Page, and I think this is the top. I I and I think what this match does is that it's a promise. This match is a promise that this is ne is not over, and I think that's really, really cool because typically you got to think, and just about everything else we've seen, mm. a Texas Death Match is typically the end of a feud. This match was so different in the sense it was a promise and it felt it felt like the beginning, mm. which is so interesting, especially now in hindsight of like they had just when you look back on this Texas death match in context, they were only just getting started with each other for real. Mm. And the blood drinking part, especially like that's what truly like linked them of just this is is going to be the guiding feud for AEW probably for the less, rest of the 2020s. It, if that if that is the guide, like the, if that is what AEW is, if it's ultimately a promotion that pits Hangman Page against Swerve Strickland for the next six years, I'm I'm all in. Like, and you know, like that's true. You just said it there. There's always going to be a part of Swerve inside Hangman Adam Page. Like, 100%. he drunk and his I think blood. it's vice versa. You think yeah. about go to the 
and the like, the revolution match was hang like swerve has hangman's face on the tights and yeah you go to the to all in swerve hmm. uh, swerve's gear right like the the swerve the eighth who's the one on the at the end of his wrist the 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 head yeah the, the close to the pulse that's hangman in the center of all, all these heads of so, and keep in mind there's some people up there's some major people up there you know you have will osprey up there you have brian dance up there can't say it's in chronological order he puts hangman in the middle every yep. single time right above him he's they're always going to be linked to each other in some shape form or fashion to where when that very first promo, who did he say right. the promotion was built around? Yeah. He said it was built Hangman. around Hangman Page. This is his ultimate scalp. Yeah. And I think also, too, in the if we've learned anything else over the last year, and as much as I hate it, the Moxes and the Omegas will not be here forever. Mm. Yep. Whether it's due to injuries or, you know, whatever. That old guard is starting to shift. And these are the guys. Like, these are the guys. Um, mm. And they understand that, and they see each other as partners instead of competition. Yeah. Um, I think from a from a personal level, and I think that that has helped the company drastically, especially when you think about where the main event picture was this time last year, mm. of genuinely, they are willing to do whatever it takes to elevate not only themselves, each other, but also, like I would say, the brand. Even down to like Hangman, just anything that he does, being in kayfabe or and, and like even like the merch situation that mm. that Swerve originally had brought up of now we see so much Hangman merch, but they really stopped production on everything related to him for probably the whole rest of 2023 through early mm. 2024 through that point, just to really kind of hone in parts of aspects of this feud of. They handled all the little details so perfectly. Mm. Yeah, and like this feud, like we we're gonna we as I said, I'm doing this as part of a series of talking about the rise of Swerve Strickland to the top of the company. This rehabilitated Hangman, as you sort of said. Like this, mm-hmm. he needed this as a main eventer. They sort of tried to rehabilitate him with him and Mox, but it didn't work for various reasons, and I think a lot of them largely political, um, which is unfortunate, but it's just the reality mm-hmm. of what happened. But in this, CM Punk's gone. He's not a part of the company anymore. Tony Khan has been forced to pick his side when he didn't really want to, um, and he will no longer have an excuse for not having hangman around like not pushing hangman this is me talking full conspiracy theories now like i've i had a i have theories that like he very much pinned rightly or wrongly he pinned a lot of what happened on hangman and hangman suffered booking wise for that and if it wasn't for like the elite guys like mox who obviously didn't like punk but did like hangman going to bat for him I, i don't know where hangman's career would be but this made it so that Tony Khan had no choice but to go, okay, one of my stars is Hangman Page. I can't not push this guy because the business that they did, you listen to the crowd every time Hangman and Swerve are on, (laughs) every time Hangman Page and Swerve are on the screen together, like the crowd immediately do it. These guys are box office now. They put bums in seats. This match put bums in seats. It sold last minute tickets. It sold last minute pay-per-view buyers. Hangman needed this um, from a a business perspective to prove himself uh, and to basically just state his case of like, no, you can't ignore me any longer. The reason that you were trying to push me down and and, or hold me back or put a lid on me is gone. And and I am I'm undeniable to use the word that Cody Rhodes used to use now. Like I I'm not undesirable. I am undeniable. Uh, And and like you can't ignore me. And this is like. He made swerve in this because of how gi- how willing to give he was uh, and how he was willing to lose and put over swerve so strongly. He gave up his signature match. This is a match that he had built a lot of equity in. He gave it up so that swerve could take that win and go to the next level. And swerve obviously deserves his praise. But Hangman cannot be denied uh, for, for what he's done for this promotion in creating who is now one of their biggest stars with this match and this particular feud uh yeah hangman cannot be denied because of that and 
this did a lot to rehabilitate him, I think, in the image, in the eyes of both like the people who are promoting this company and also its fans. Absolutely. I think Hangman is absolutely undeniable of any criticism, I guess, or any feelings that people have against him. It can't be about anything that he does in that ring because I, he's one person, everything clicks. I think he's a exceptional talker. He's an exceptional worker. He has an outstanding attention to detail, and he is, in my opinion, the best in-ring storyteller in professional wrestling. And I think that this was a very important feud for him to re-elevate him to that status. Like I said, very few top guys are vulnerable enough or willing to be vulnerable enough to accomplish what they accomplished in this feud, to really commit to the long game. And to commit to the long game of saying, like, yes, you're going to lose a lot up front. But eventually you will win. And when you do win, it's going to change everything. And I, I, a lot of guys aren't willing to trust the process like that. And I, and there's different reasons for that. Like, sometimes you shouldn't touch, trust the process. Sometimes there is no process. Um, Do you know, contrast, uh, at this very feud, mm-hmm. another contrast of, like, things that were not working at the time. Like, at this very pay-per-view it was clear that the Bucks were meant to beat FTR, but it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. The match never happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it was a lot. There was a lot of – there was just so much politics, I think, around yep. that time. But I went to All In, and I didn't go yep. to All Out last year. Um, but this year, like, the reason why – even full gear at that point, I was – after All In, I, I told myself, I'm good on AEW pay-per-views, honestly. Mm. But then I said, I'm good for the rest of the year. I said, I don't really feel like traveling. I said, I'm just going to focus on going to Japan. Like, that's just, mm. and I probably should have now that I think about how much that trip costs, but it's okay. <laughs> I, I did it all, did it all. But then the Hangman Swerve for you happened. And I was just like, okay, I should go. I was already leaning towards going to Seattle for Wrestle Dream just because once they said it was an Antonio Inoki theme show and always any type of like New Japan collab, I'm there. But especially after All Out. When that, that first Dynamite, when I knew that's where we hit, I said, oh, I'm going to Seattle. Mm. And I, I was like, I'm going to Seattle. And for full gear, I damn sure didn't want to go. I knew I didn't want to go with that title program. But Texas Death Match, I end up in L.A. Same thing for, like, All Out. I wasn't planning on going All Out at all this year. But when they announced this, they, when I first hear Inklings that, you know, the Steel Cage match is going to be there, Go to All Out. Like, for a lot of the hardcore fans, this feud was such a difference maker. I can't tell you I would have been at certain pay-per-views or as invested if it wasn't for this feud. Um, And like I said, it's just so much investment that goes into this that I think that a lot of guys just aren't willing to do, which is unfortunate. But it's what separates the good from the great, in my opinion, of... I think that this feud is a, was a massive equalizer across AEW to show, okay, like, who wants this and who doesn't? And I think it also elevated everybody else in the sense mm. of, by the, because of the standard they set with that Texas death match, when, by the time that we got to All Out for that steel cage match, everybody who was on the card with them knew that we got to up our, whatever we're doing, we got to make it. 10 times freakier, crazier. Yeah. If we're on the same card as Hangman and Swerve, we have to go 10 times harder. And I think mm. that's how you get... I think MJF Garcia was a lot grittier than I expected. I think that you had the... the what was a show stealer in Willow versus Statlander. You end up having that crazy moment of trying to kill Brian Danielson. I think that... Hangman Swerve's feud reminded everybody that this is what an alternative is supposed to be. Mm. And it I think it forced everybody to reimagine what they were doing in their matches in the sense of, okay, this is what would an alternative do with this? Like what what's an alternative? How can we take this further mm. than what's normal, considered normal of what we've seen before? How do we press the envelope? And I think that they really set the trend for that. Yeah, I feel like MJF definitely took notes when he was going to the program with Garcia. I think MJF took notes and was like, well, okay, and it makes what sense. went wrong with what went wrong with me and Adam Cole? How can I fix that? And and going to this and obviously at time of recording, 
uh, you know, it's sort of getting towards the end of September. We're not sure what's going to happen with Garcia's contract, but it seems like he wanted to set up something along those lines with the way he approached, I think, that feud in particular. He wanted to create, like, a gritty long-term story where the characters go through a little bit of change and and do pretty depraved, gritty things to each other uh, in response to how well that uh, Hangman and Swerve got accepted. And you like, got to think from MJF's perspective of uh, – they tried to make it seem like it wasn't like this, but for, like, I think for a lot of fans – even as world champion, he was living in the feud and in the shadows of this feud for months in the sense of you're doing press conference and they're asking you, what did you think about Hangman and Swerve? Mm. You're like, everything was sur- like, even if though they weren't the main event, they were carrying the company to the point to where it felt like he was almost a paper champion. And yep. so I think that those feelings are definitely have carried over to, to an all out where he's just like, okay, I do have to step it up of just like, I would have been so disappointed. Like you, uh, and I hate to continue to rag on that world title feud, but when you look at the matches that were happening on the same cars that Hangman and Swerve were on, MJF fought the Righteous alone in a handicap match for the Ring, Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships at Wrestle Dream. That mm. the, and Full Gear had that hokey match versus Jay White. Started out as Adam Cole versus Jay White. Adam Cole lost a leg. Yep. It just, it, it, there was no comparison. And so I would hope by the time we swing about around the all out, you got wrestling like you got some sense. Lyric, we're fast running out of time. If you've got time for one more question, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd love to answer, ask just one more thing. So, of course, coming out of this, um, we've kind of, I think we've dealt extensively with this. So we'll move on from Hangman and Swerve. Maybe one day, oh, definitely one day we'll be coming back to it for sure um, to, to talk about other matches that these guys have had since. Um, but, of course, coming out of the, of this all, Swerve is on another level. He is the probably the most popular person in AEW at that point. And it seems like only a matter of time before he becomes the AEW champion. In fact, I think it was uh, on re- on What Culture, the, the day after this in their full gear review, they said it would be booking malpractice if Swerve Strickland isn't your world champion in 2024. And and I did these podcasts to talk about the rise of Swerve in AEW. And it'd be sort of remiss of me not to to get into this with you because when AEW was very, very early in its time, there was a lot of discourse around them not having a black champion um, as early as some had hoped. Uh, now, some of this was absolutely just the worst bad faith actors um, and they ignored, you know, like black and la- Latino champs. They ordered, they ignored black champions in the tag TNT and women's and FTW divisions. But like ultimately the world, the AW World Championship is the most prestigious championship in AEW and has always been billed that way. And Swerve was the first black man to win that championship. Um, and so Lyric, I guess I just wanted to get your your reflections on what he achieved in that, and then also just. I guess some of your your thoughts around the discourse that has been around AEW and uh, its its treatment of black wrestlers and uh, and and also the treatment of him as once he became champion. Yeah. Um. What a question. I I think that Swerve's rise to the world championship should be the blueprint for any free agent, let alone black free agent, but any free agent of just that's the timeline there. Sign in 2022, ch- world champion by 2024. If a company really looks at you like a star, if they see you as a star signing, they have plans for you. They have plans for you. They have intention to get you from point A to B. I'm not saying that AEW originally saw Swerve being world champion immediately, but they obviously had plans for him. And I think that that is what I want to see going forward for black wrestlers. I think that too many times, There's been this long wait. You'll see people be on a roster for 10, 12, you know, 14 years, and then they'll finally get a championship run, world title run, but they're not seen as the number one guy at all. And it's just like, I don't want to see that anymore. I'm not interested in seeing that anymore. I want to see black wrestlers who are doing the work, who are genuinely like, you know, getting over with the crowd, be rewarded for their good deeds. And I don't want it to take forever to do it. And I I think, and I think here's the thing. 
think no wrestling company is above reproach. I think we should always ask questions as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, um, representation. Well put. But at the same time, AEW is a five-year-old company. And I think that you know, a lot of those criticisms, like you said, was in bad faith. Like, in, in all actuality, the first black world champion at AEW is Nyla Rose. If you want to be, if you <laughs> want to be completely honest about it, and that happened, you know, very early on. Think about who holds the record for the TBS championship. I mean, half of the TBS champions have been black women. Um, a, you look at the tag championships, there was a point where literally we went from one black tag team to another black tag team, you know, in that lineage in 2022 between the acclaimed and swerve in our glory. And so the same thing with the TNT championship. There's been, you know, the, there's been Scopey so many. nine hubs. Exactly. And, but I, obviously they're going to continue to move the goalposts. And like, here's the thing, AEW has not always gotten it right. And I have like, you know, sit when they have it. And even in certain points where I wasn't like, you know, fully engaged with the product and I think things happened. I think even like the big school situation was handled very poorly. But yeah. I think in moments Agreed. like that, you expect for a company to do better. And I think that they did. I think that all the improvements that people were asking for them to make, maybe not all, but for most of them, yeah, they did. When you look at that women's division, Black women are on top. When you look at the, you know, the the men's title picture, Swerve is honestly higher than almost everybody in the company. Tag division, we need to get, we need to do some work. And I, but I think that the progress has been there, and I, I I think that it should be celebrated. And I think that Swerve has also been a big part of it because here's the thing: even if you don't like him. You should like what he represents. And I think what he represents is black talent being treated like franchise players. And when he finally became champion, I've never seen anybody do something, do more with a four month reign. Like, I I mean, I put him at number three for like all time AEW world champions. The only people I would put in front of him is like Kenny and Mox. And for a first-time world champion, number three in that lineage is absolutely incredible. Mm. Uh, I think it's just, I, I, I think it's, it, it's been incredible. I think we should always continue to push forward. Because honestly, at this point, where we are, the fact that AEW had a, their first black champion and it went so successfully in year five is already head and shoulders above just about anything else we've ever seen before. Five, in five years. Like, let's just be real. Like, that's an accomplishment um, compared to other wrestling companies, especially mainstream wrestling companies. Mm-hmm. Five years, is a very short turnaround time. But I think, like, I implore people to now open that conversation up a little bit more because I, obviously, as a black woman, I want to see black excellence always, and I'm always advocating for the inclusion of black talent. But there's so many more fights that I need, I think, need to be addressed. Like, for example, of uh, the utilization of luchadors like and i think that you know mexican wrestlers like you know latino wrestlers are carrying australian wrestlers I'm just kidding yes you. Sorry. Sorry. go ahead you know hey man <laughs> are carrying the undercard carrying you know so many of like those those matches for the sickos are being carried by luchadors but i want to see them win I want to see championships. I want to see them pushed as legitimate threats in the company. I do think that, you know, like with guys like Hologram and Beast Mortos, I think we're going to see that. But until we do, I think that there's still going to be a lot of questions, Mm -hmm. the inclusion of Japanese talent. Um, I want to see Okada or Takeshi to become the first Japanese world champion. And I want to see it fairly soon. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I think that there's a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of other demographics that still are waiting on that first spot. And I think my co-host for Wednesday nights on our, the dynamite book post show, Danny says it best from black girl wrestling swerve did this. This is great. So who's next? Who else are we grooming to be the second black girl Mm. champion? You know, and I don't think that that is very evident. I don't think that that is something that, you know, it's, I, I don't think we know that. I think it's not very clear of who that person is going to be. Is anybody even being built up 
to be in that position right now? And I don't think the answer is yes. So that's why I'm worried, at least for the men's division, I think the women's division, there's at least like three black women who I think are primed to be world champion before the end of 2026. And that's just fantastic. Um, mm. Just I, And it makes me extremely happy to even just think about it. But from a man perspective of those are more so the questions that I have. But I think that as far as the work that has been laid, I think the AEW has probably done more than anybody else. And also, let's just be real. The behind the scenes aspect of there are two black people in administration and like high ranking positions in the company, which is you can't say that for other wrestling promotions. And I think that that makes a huge difference, especially when in a feud like this. When you are talking about race in wrestling, and there are so many times it could have gone extremely wrong in this hangman swerve, but the cultural sensitivity showed that they have actual black people in the writing room. And so that's more so where I'm thinking of like going forward of swerve being the first black champion was amazing. That's great. But what's next? And how do we continue to expand and grow representations on both sides of the camera, both in front of it and behind it? But yeah, I've seen a lot of growth from AEW, I would say, since that day one. And even me personally, like I I said at the beginning of this, I was a sport entertainment management major. I had dreams working wrestling. And when I saw Brandy at that first press conference, and she's the first black woman in a major ranking position in pro wrestling, I'm like, whoa that is incredible. And I had never seen that before. And I get to tell my professors in my classes, like, no, like this is do- happening like right now in wrestling. And so like, you know, that changes things. And so I, I'm in- interested and excited to see them continue to progress in that aspect. Very well put. Very well put. I definitely, uh, I won't add too much of my own spin to that other than I just, I think you put it very well there, Lyric. It's interesting somehow, like just on that last thing you said, that so often it, AEW is so success, viewed as so successful from the outside, but if you're in the wrestling bubble, it's constantly a shambles and in, uh, a cold promotion and uh, horrible and on its way out. But outside of the wrestling bubble, people view the things that AEW has achieved as a success and incredibly truly as remarkable you bring up brandy Rhodes as the chief brand officer for AEW in wrestling circles and see the reaction you get whereas you know yourself at that time sort of not on the inside of the wrestling bubble more on the outside uh and and relating that to people who don't know anything about wrestling and they're like, wow, that's not something I expected. So and you talk to people who are actually in the sport and entertainment industry, like actual like business professionals and if they hear anything about AEW and like what they've done and they've accomplished as a challenger brand, they're blown away. Yeah. Like they're even, legitimately blown away. I even got to experience it a little bit when they announced this Australian show because they've been doing PR for the Australian mm-hmm. show. Uh, and my colleagues know that like it's it's almost a, like that it'll often be on one of the, uh, you know, how to a, a get to know you sort of thing. Like, did you know that the people in this team do these things? And one of the things will be one of our team members host a pro wrestling podcast. Um, so they know that I'm into it. And uh, and having them talk to me and ask me questions about AEW and them being like, oh, wow, I didn't even know that was happening. That's really cool. They're, Suncorp Stadium. Wow, that's cool that they're doing that. So, you know, like. From from outside the bubble, it, it just seems like this thing is this thing's you know been an amazing success. Whereas inside it, it's so often not because of you know hundreds of reasons that we don't have time to get into. But yeah, well put. And and all I'd add was it's pretty amazing that Tony Khan he's he's a Pakistani man. Like it, it's pretty amazing that a guy from the Middle East is and obviously he's a billionaire, so he's an incredibly he's an he's in an incredibly privileged position. Um, and I'm not saying that that necessarily like that he is, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to pick my words very delicately here, but look, all I'd say is that it is pretty amazing that he is a, a man of color himself from a, you know, like a very diverse background, a, a background that is not traditionally um, one that is privileged in Western society, um, either in America or here where I live in Australia. Um, and yet, he is running this promotion and he he's running it incredibly well uh, and, you know, offering opportunities to so many people um, who are from diverse backgrounds themselves. And I think that is reflected in, you know, how he approaches talent. I, I don't like, 
obviously it did take them five years to have, find an AEW world champion. I don't really think if you look at who was around, I don't really think they had someone who they could put in that position. And it would have been unfair to just put the title onto someone who wasn't ready for it. It would have been really unfair to them to do that. Uh, but with Swerve, they found the person and they built him up and it was a phenomenal success. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I'll i leave it at that because there'll be more times where I'll come back to talk more about Swerve in the future on this podcast. No, um, I would also say, sorry, really quickly on that standpoint. No, too, go for it. Not only did they push him to the moon, they let him be himself of just the outward yes. displays of black culture that I've seen during Swerve's reign. I'm not sure. It's just different. Like, it's just different. It, like, they didn't dumb it down. They didn't water it down. They didn't, they, like, it was very much so what you see, what you get, and people just responded to it. Like, freaking yeah. Bun B and Wibbly Stadium. Like, bro, what? I grew up listening to 36. Like, what? Like, it, it's, it's stuff like that that just blows my mind. Like, I can't believe this is happening in wrestling right now. Like, yeah. I can't believe this is happening in wrestling. Like, somebody who grew up in the culture, a hip hop fan, you know, a wrestling fan of just seeing things. I think, obviously, we've seen those things like hip hop and wrestling interact before, but a lot of times it doesn't feel genuine. It very feels like a marketing ploy of like, it felt very not like seeing these things come together and feel natural. Mm. You can't put it into words. Can't quantify it, man. Yeah. Look, all I'll say is that thank God I've got people like yourselves and Rich and James from one nation so that I don't miss half of it. (laughs) (laughs) Shout out to them. I love one nation radio. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of love for those guys here. Look, Lyric, that's everything we've I've got to talk about. I, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say? And if not, uh, feel free to give your plugs out and let people know where they can find you. Well, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. I I love yapping. And it's so funny that before um, we started this, you had said, I've never had an episode go over two hours. Well, here we are. <laughs> said, oh, I'm a real yapper. Um but no, thank you for having me. I love talking about wrestling. I love talking about this feud. Um, and yeah, um, you can find me at Lyric Wrestling on Twitter and Instagram. And you can subscribe to my YouTube channel at Lyric Swinton um, for everything. There's so much stuff there. Interviews, um, podcast episodes, travel blogs, et cetera. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in to listen. I really appreciate it. It feels like I'm well and truly back on track with uh, this podcast, building to to some really fun things that I've got cooking in the background. Um, and I can't wait to have everyone along for the ride with me. If you don't follow me, you can find me on social media at Sir underscore Samuel uh, and You can also join, you can reach out to me on the Social Suplex Discord. There's a link for that in the description. If you've got a match you'd like me to cover on this podcast, come suggest it. We've got a thread there to talk about the AW Match Guide podcast. Come suggest a match for me to dig into on that on that uh, that Discord. You can also find my written work on the Match Guide Substack. Uh, I tend to drop a column there every fortnight or so, um, talking about things that are going on in wrestling, or uh, sometimes I just randomly review old matches that I enjoy um, and just kind of go with what I'm feeling at the time on that. So you can find that link in the description as well. And of course, please rate and review the podcast. It really helps us out if you could give us five of the big ones on whatever podcast app you are on. Uh, And you can listen to the rest of the Social Suplex podcast network as well. As I said at the top, we've got One Nation Radio, Keeping It Strong Style, All Things Elite, Tunnel Talk, the Trish and Sarah Wrestling Podcast, Wrestle Art with Chris Things and Imp's WWE Adventure. And as I said, halfway through as well, Please check out the merch store on Chop Tees. We had a lot of fun putting it together. It's great looking clothing as well. So come on, support the network. Um, Go the big lift for us um, and we'll go the big lift for you. Uh, And that's all I've got to say that other than thank you for listening. And you can join me again in about a fortnight's time where I'm going to be talking about John Moxley versus Brian Danielson 
from Revolution 2022. The formation of the Blackpool Combat Club, a lot to dig into there with one of my old sparring partners from Lords of Pain, Maverick. Um, that's one that some of you who uh, have been following my work for a while, that's a person that you guys will know um, to look out for. So that's one to look out for in a fortnight's time. Please join me then, and thank you so much for listening today. Until I see you again next time, thank you for listening again, and bye. Thanks for listening to the AEW Match Guide podcast. If you enjoyed the show, then you can subscribe on the podcast app of your choice so you never miss an episode. Also, feel free to let me know on Twitter at Sir underscore Samuel. I'd love to hear from you. The AEW Match Guide podcast is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network, where you can find many other fantastic podcasts discussing not just AEW, but all parts of the world of professional wrestling. Looking forward to seeing you again next week. I'm Sam Brown. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, for thousands of appetizing ingredients that inspire countless mouth-watering meals. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week, and up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with points. So you can get big flavors and big savings. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply.